Welcome to Codex History of Video Games. I'm Tyler Osby. And I'm Mike Coletta. And this week, it's a mailbag episode. We're going to read a bunch of emails. We have so many emails to read. We do. We might not get through all of them today. We might not read all of them. There's just so many. Who knows? There are so many emails. So, I guess do we just do we just jump into it. I think we just start with Rude Days 93's email. Okay. Okay. Do you do you want me to read it? You want to read it? I, I, let me read it. I, I, I'm ready. Okay. I was born. You're ready. I was All born right. for this. So the subject line is your perfect controller. Hi, hey Mike and Tyler. Rude Days 93 here again. And having just listened to your controller tier list, I thought it'd be fun to build your own controller that would be perfect for each of you. So I made a list of questions here, and some of your answers can be part, any part from a controller from the past. So with seven questions, we can pick controllers from the past, and I think we're just going to start out with question okay. one. So we're we're like mixing and matching controllers to to make the perfect controller. We're not wholly designing a new controller here. That's true. I think we can like okay. we can like Frankenstein a controller together. Okay, because I do think my my answer to the perfect controller and my answer to my favorite Frankenstein controller are probably different. Oh, so should we go Frankenstein? Let's go Frankenstein. Yeah, let's Frankenstein. Let's Frankenstein. Okay, so the first one is the body and the shape of the controller. What would you choose? The Wii U Pro Controller. That was so quick. Yeah, I think it feels the best in 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 hand. That I, I do really like the Xbox One controller though too. I was gonna go Xbox One controller. That was gonna also be a good choice. Thing. Yeah, I don't. I think the Switch Pro controller also feels pretty good. But you know, I need to hook up my Wii U Pro controller and, and use it on like some PC games or something because I do really love that controller. Yeah, I've been using my Nintendo Switch Pro controller, and I am a huge fan of it. So, internal or external batteries? Second question. Uh, this to me is kind want, of a no-brainer. Can I tell you my opinion? Yes. I want external batteries. Me too. Absolutely. I no know brainer. it's like you can get your own rechargeable double A's. That's rechargeable mm-hmm. double A's are the perfect situation for this kind yep. of controller. It's everything yes, you want. I agree. That's what I use. It's it's perfect because rechargeable double A's are really good right now. Like the technology's there. You can get like 40 hours battery life out of them. And then if you buy like 12 of them, you'll never have to worry about controller batteries. For right now, for me, it seems like as long as I live, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I feel like I'm good. Yeah. And you can like reload them like you're reloading a gun in your game. You know, you're like, Whoa, ch- ch-. I do. You know what I mean? You just dump them out and like put new ones in, close it off and you're like back into it. I make the noise too um, every time I do it. Me too. I think the problem that I have with internal batteries, uh, and this is going to become a problem for more people as time goes on, I think. Batteries, like lithium ion batteries that are rechargeable are great. They do not last forever, and they especially do not last forever if you haven't used them in a while. My PS3 controller, absolutely dead. They can't do anything about it except for like buy a new battery, take the controller apart, like swap a new battery in. And then, so I played a few PS3 games after I did that with my my dead PS3 controller. And then, you know, I put it it down for a year because I don't play PS3 games all that often, especially not on my PS3 itself. And I went to go play, I was going to go play something. Still dead. It's dead again. I got to buy another $10 battery to take the controller apart and put the new battery in. But you know what's not dead? My Xbox 360 controllers. I just pop new batteries in there. Good to go. Always good to go. And you take the batteries out. And if you store like your Xbox 360 controllers, you don't have to worry about corrosion or anything weird happening right. to your controllers. That, that's, you do have to worry about that with double A's. That is easily uh, well, if you uh, take mitigated out, by though, just taking the batteries yeah. out. Right, yeah. But I have opened up like Xbox 360 controllers that I haven't used in a while and been like, oh no, what happened here? Um, and like on my Steam controller too, because that uses double A's. And I did have a corrosion problem on my Steam controller once, which was a real oh, bummer, but I, I cleaned it up. and Yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was fixable, but it was scary. And so now I don't keep batteries in it because they don't make that controller anymore. Next question, you ready? Yeah. Asymmetric or symmetric joysticks? That's a tough one. I kind of go back and forth. Like I said, I really like the Wii U Pro Controller. They are symmetric joysticks, but they are uh, not like, they're they're the opposite of what the PlayStation symmetric joysticks are. So they're like, they're up above the D-pad and the, the face buttons. And I kind of like that, but I think overall, I go with asymmetric because I really like the Xbox One layout. I think if I had to pick one, that's what I go with. Me too. 100% asymmetric joystick man myself. Yeah, I, it's really just what you're used to. I don't think there's any real, uh, uh, like, 
like pros or cons to either. Like it's just what you're used to, I think. Next question. A, B, X, Y, the sacred symbols, something else for your controller buttons, your face buttons. What do you feel? Uh, for practicality uh, reasons, I think because I'm mainly a PC gamer, I think I go A, B, X, Y, Xbox style just because they match up with most games. Um, you can do A, B, X, Y like Nintendo style where A is on the right, B is on the is below, Y is the left, and X is the top. Um, that's fine. The sacred symbols, I don't like that because is it X or is it cross? Is it circle or is it O? Is it square, triangle? Why do I need three syllables to, t- to, to describe the button I'm about to push? Just I just A, B, X, Y. Just do that. And I like the color, this color scheme, ABXY. I do too. I'm I'm holding my Xbox One controller in my hands and looking at it right now. And I think mm-hmm. the, also the other part about it is the shape of the button super important. Yeah. I want big circular buttons. I'm gonna say that like something really I can I can hit easily, like almost bigger than the current Xbox One controller is what I would say. Yeah. So no, are you a fan of the GameCube layout or not? Not particularly. Yeah. The GameCube controller is one of those controllers that everyone swears by that I was kind of just like okay with, but it might be because I never owned a GameCube until much later in life, and I yeah. rarely play the GameCube I own, or GameCubes, I should say. I have two because one a comedy club closed and I took their GameCube. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty Oh, bad. man. Remind me when we're done here. There are some cool mods you can do to a GameCube, especially if you have t- if you have one that you like. You have two, so you could like take a risk on one. There's some there's some cool stuff. Take a chance, take a chance, take a chance, chance, yeah. chance. You can you can get to you can get it to load games off of a micro SD card. There's like a little bit of soldering involved, but not too much. I think it's like the perfect. It's one of the perfect. Now that mods. I help with students in electronics class, I'm learning to solder currently, so that's nice. not going to be a problem anymore for me. Also, I'm looking at my controller and it is filthy, so I'm going to go put it away because it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Your GameCube controller? Yeah, I, I agree. It's kind of hard right now because I'm straight up just designing an Xbox controller is what I'm doing by with this list. I'm not mm-hmm. really changing it too much in particular, but I will be changing stuff particularly in the end. Okay. The next question is, do you have both bumpers and triggers and from which controller? Uh, the answer is yes, and you take them from the PS5 controller. They're so good on the PS5, especially the triggers with the with the like the way that they can like sort of simulate resistance on it. I don't know if you've used a PS5 controller with a game that does that. It's so cool. I haven't, but I actually was going to say that I don't like the shoulder buttons on Xbox controllers as much as the PlayStation. That might be the only thing the PlayStation that I think does better controller yeah. wise than Xbox is the trigger buttons. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, and, and like the Wii U Pro Controller and the Switch Pro Controller, they don't have analog triggers, which is like kind of a bummer. Which It's especially a bummer because the GameCube did have analog triggers. Yeah, that's a weird design choice. I wonder why they did that. Yeah. So any other buttons on it, it says. This would be a start button, a share button, a back button, a back paddles, etc. So this is where I kind of want to diverge. Okay. I don't like the Xbox One having the symbols. So it has on the right side the three lines in the middle, and then on the left side the two squares like kind of overlapping. I what want, are those even supposed to be? I don't know. I'm a start and select man. That's what I want. I Same. just want start select. Put start select on there. That's all. That's all I need. Mm-hmm, Unless mm-hmm. and you can even make the buttons like kind of they were on the uh, super. Nintendo, where they're wider and then you have above the button the words written, mm-hmm. that would be what I would want, even, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, get rid of the share button. I've never once used it on any console ever. Yeah. I don't, I guess I don't really share stuff straight from my console to like Twitter or anything like that. Maybe if I were more active on social media, I would like that, but I'm not. I do like back paddles. Um, I've only ever really used them on the Steam controller, but I know if you get like a Xbox Pro controller and things like that, you can get back paddles. I do kind of like that, especially for shooters where like your jump button is A or something like that and you have to take your thumb off of the thumbstick to jump. If you have a back paddle, you can set the back paddle to be the jump button or reload or things like that. And then you never have to take your thumb off of the joystick, which is very helpful when you're trying to like jump and also shoot, especially in a game like halo where if, if you can jump while you're fighting you have the upper hand dude i've never used back paddles on the controller before 
I feel like lesser of a first person shooter player because of it. Yeah, it's one of the the, the advantages that uh, like mouse and keyboard has. I mean, there's a lot of advantages mouse and keyboard has. I don't need we don't need to get into it right now. But like being able to hit space bar and also aim while you're in the air jumping is a pretty big deal. Uh, and that's harder to do if you have to take your thumb off of the joystick to jump. Gotcha. Well, now I'm going to look into back paddles. Tyler, look what you've done. Mm-hmm. Final question. Any other features on your controller? This could be gyro, rumble, haptic feedback, etc. cetera. Uh, give me everything the PlayStation 5 controller has. The haptic feedback, which is also like the rumble is kind of all in there. It's it is on another level the kind of stuff that they do with the haptic feedback in the PlayStation 5 controller. It also has a gyro, and it has that cool touchpad thing, which is not that useful in most games, but sometimes, especially in a game like Final Fantasy XIV and MMO, it's nice to be able to just move the mouse around sometimes because a game like that actually has a mouse pointer that you can use. And that game plays really well on a, on a, a game controller regardless of whether or not you have a trackpad, but sometimes that's kind of nice. I think it's cool. I have an unpopular opinion. I don't want any of it. Get, you don't want any of it. You don't, don't want rumble? I don't want rumble. I don't want feedback. I don't want gyro. I like it better when my Xbox One controller is closer to dead and it stops using rumble. I genuinely wow. don't like it. Yeah, I think it's just... It, you could turn it off in most yeah, games. Yeah, I, I know. And I, 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 sh- I do sometimes, but I'm also a lazy man and I forget. <laughs> <laughs> so I honestly could do without it though. I was kind of the guy when, I, when N64 had a rumble pack. I was like, I mean, I'm not going to use this. Someone else can use yeah. this. Yeah. How did you find the secrets in Ocarina of Time? Uh, the, the Stone of Agony. See, I, I wasn't a big fan. I, I wasn't a big fan of rumble. What can I say? You didn't you know? find any of those secrets. Didn't find any of those secrets. I lived without those secrets my whole life. I've been doing fine. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I I think gyro is underrated. Uh, it's. It, it makes playing games on a shooters again on a on a controller very much uh, comparable to playing with a mouse and keyboard. I think if you got really good with gyro, you could be probably almost as good as you could be with a mouse and keyboard. Oh, that's an interesting opinion. I never really thought of it that way, especially on the Steam Deck where you get a joystick, um, but the joystick knows when your thumb is on it, and that's what act what you can set it up to activate the gyro. So when your thumb is on the joystick and you're already like using it to move around you can uh uh that that's when gyro is activated and so you can make those fine-tuned movements with your with just by turning the controller um it's kind of weird on a thing like the switch or the steam deck because you're turning your entire device rather than just the, the controller um but like it's it's for those like fine-tuned movements like you're not moving your hands very much you're not like turning your controller all the way around to try to aim at something you're just like moving it a little bit and it really helps with those like last little touches i think you know, we never really got the Tyler Osby review of the Steam Deck. Would you like to do that right after this email? Could I finish up reading this email and you could give us your thoughts on it? Oh, yeah, I can I can give you thoughts on it. I, I don't have any like formal things put together, but I certainly have a lot of thoughts, I guess. Well, let me finish reading Rude Days 93's email here, okay? Okay. Hope okay. you guys have fun with this. Also, I did notice you did leave off my personal favorite from the tier list, the Xbox Elite Controller. While expensive, the battery life on it is amazing, and the detachable joysticks, along with the introduction of the back paddles, makes it one of the best controllers to customize and fit how you want to play, and in my opinion, definitely belongs in S tier. Before I end this, I did want to offer another possible tier list ranking. How about the best console launch games of all time? may need to restructure the tier rankings and add an SS and SSS tier because there are some bangers. Halo, Mario, and Zelda, oh my. That's a great idea. I really want to do that one now. I'm writing it down. I'm writing it on here. Best console That is a really good games. idea. Maybe that will uh, be our next little fun episode we do because we got to finish out that book. You know what I mean? Yeah. We got we to finish yeah. out Console Wars. I didn't realize it's such a beefy book when we started it. It's a real it beefy really book. It really is. But I love it. Yeah. Um, I think the reason we didn't do the Xbox Elite controller is we just kind of considered it too close to the Xbox One controller. I mean, it's just, it, it is mostly the same. The back paddles are cool. Detachable joysticks is neat, like being able to swap those for different kinds of joysticks and the different D-pads. Oh, that's one thing we should talk about. What's your favorite D-pad? What D-pad would you put on this? Ooh, I actually really like the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller's D-pad. Yeah, that's a good, that's a solid choice. It's similar to like the one they introduced with the DS, I think. I do think I like the Xbox one. controller D-pad is trash. It's, tra- it's trash can potato, Real bad. if you will. 
It's not yeah. very good. Yeah. PlayStation has a good one. I think I go with um, like the Super Nintendo style that Nintendo used on the Game Boy and the NES and the Super Nintendo and the, um, I guess they had one on the N64 controller too, the Game Boy. Did I say Game Boy? Uh, I like that one the best. I don't know if that's just because it's what I grew up with or if it's actually better, but that's how I feel. Yeah, agreed. I also think that Nintendo just knows D-pads. They're just good with yes. their D-pads. They make really good ones. That's just what they've that's always true. done. Yeah, the 3DS D-pad is, eh, eh. Eh. It's, a, it's a misstep in my opinion. It's a oh a serious misstep. Yeah, you know what? Also, the Xbox 360 D-pad is even worse than the Xbox One D-pad. Yeah, I don't know why they really like they just kind of gave up on that part of it. Maybe they just thought it wouldn't be used. Like they included it to be included, but they didn't really care. Yeah, and I mostly use it. For example, in The Witcher Three, I'm using it for like items. Yeah, when they when it's used as just like when it's not the main like control input of like how you're controlling your character, it's fine because it just they're just four more buttons. It's not really, but yeah, when it has to be used as your direct input, then that feels bad. Totally. Well, now that we're done with Rude Days ninety three email, thank you Rude Days ninety three. Could we get your s- thoughts? Not a review. Your thoughts on the Steam Deck? Yeah. It's huge. That's what I don't like about it. It's very big. Um, But the controller on it is awesome because it is all the great things about the Steam controller with a second joystick, which is the one thing most people will tell you about the Steam controller. Even diehard Steam controller fans such as myself will tell you thing needed a second joystick. And uh, the Steam Deck has two joysticks. The gyro is great. Um, And like I said about the the, the uh, joystick that it knows your thumb is on it and that can activate the gyro that is the perfect way to do that um i haven't played a whole lot of games on it i mean performance wise you can if you want to know what the performance is there's 800 million videos on youtube that that uh show you exactly the performance is generally speaking it'll play anything you want you're just gonna have to turn the settings down there aren't really any games that it just cannot play um except for games that don't run on steam os which is uh, not an insignificant amount of games because the Steam Deck is a PC. It doesn't run Windows. And so it's running Windows games through like a translation layer on, on Linux, which is very cool in my opinion, but not every game works well with it. Um, but many do. So, um, and for that reason, there are games like Destiny that don't work. Games with anti-cheat tend to not work because uh, I guess the anti-cheat doesn't play nicely with the translation layer that they've done. So if you're trying to play Destiny on your Steam Deck, you're going to have to install Windows. Um, or you're going to not play Steam or play Destiny on it. I heard you'll um, get like banned. Yeah, because they're, they're, cause it's like technically circumventing their their anti-cheat, I guess. Like it, it won't pass the anti-cheat tests, you know, that they run on your system or whatever. Um, and so if you don't pass those tests, you just get banned. So don't do it. Yeesh. Uh, yeah, it's pretty rough. Yeah, I hope they come around on that and figure it out. Like some of the other anti-cheats have, have sort of figured it out. I think Halo Infinite finally figured it out so that it can run on the Steam Deck. Um, I hope Bungie comes around and, and figures it out. But for now, I understand why, because if you just start letting things through your anti-cheat, then that makes it easier for cheat makers to make cheats. So you got to make sure that it's good. Totally. Um, that's kind of it. I, that's It's got a real D-pad. It's got... Uh, the Steam OS is very cool for all of the games that it works with. Um, and you can put the thing to sleep in during most games which is not really a feature of windows pcs if you put your pc to sleep while a game is open uh, which is not really something you have to do on a desktop pc very often but on your on your handheld you will definitely do that a lot um lot there's like a 50 50 chance when you come back to your game it's just not going to work um but on steam deck it works pretty well so yeah comes with a big old case like i said it's huge and the battery life is not great it's like two or three hours maybe less depending on how how hard you're uh, work in it. If you're playing indie games uh, that are less demanding on the system, then you're going to get more battery life. If you're playing Stardew Valley, you can probably get like six or eight hours. If you're trying to play uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake, you might get an hour and a half. You know, it's it's really depends on what you're trying to play. Good to know. I was curious about it, and I'm like, maybe I should hold off. And I think hopefully the technology gets there with the battery. That's what really needs to happen, huh? Yeah. I, I think uh, Steam Deck 2 is going to be way better it's gonna it'll it'll be a little bit smaller and uh this is just my prediction i'm not i don't know anything about it but i think it'll be smaller um 
but probably the same battery life. I think the battery life thing is going to uh, forever be sort of a problem because it's just a trade-off between performance and battery life. And I will always want the option at least to have more performance. Yeah, especially in PC gaming. I mean, that's the big part of it, right? Right, right. And you, it, there's a lot of tweaks you can do. Like if you want to play a game at 60 FPS, you're going to get less battery life. But if you choose to limit your FPS to like 30, you're going to get better battery life. So you have a lot of options to play around with it too, which is really cool. Nice. Well, I'm glad we got your opinion on it. That's yeah. what we get. Ty, that's yep. what people want. People want Tyler Osby's <laughs> video game opinions. Well, thanks. Do you want to read this email from Joel from Texas? Yeah. We got an email from Joel from Texas. Not strictly video game related, but uh, I, 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 I want to talk about it anyway. Um, so the subject is, are DVDs dead? Hello and happy Mexican Independence Day. This is not really video game related, but I know y'all have gone through a few outdated technologies, so I wanted to hear y'all's opinion. Just wanted to tell you of what my government teacher said that offended me. He said, DVDs are a dead technology. As someone who grew up with DVDs, that upset me, though I said nothing out loud. Uh, since I would say that is wrong. Sure, they're being phased out, but I ain't calling it till the till the corpse do it and uh, stop selling them at Walmart. Oh, I can see what he's saying there. Uh, what do you all What do you all say? Oh, bears of knowledge that is related to technologies and video game stuff. Keep up the good work, Spider Butts. Joel, unknown soldier of the revolution, son of two nations, cat lover. That's that quite, is quite the title. Yeah, it's a big title. Do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? I have some thoughts on this. Why don't you go first? So, if you look at certain things like I'm, i actually just took like a right responder course to like cpr dvds and those kind of courses are still very much alive you know yeah and also in education dvds are handy because a lot of the time you're not allowed to access netflix or other accounts on public education internet you, you just can't do that on their networks mm, yeah 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 so DVDs, yeah, they might be a dead technology for consumers, but in a lot of other aspects of the world, and we know this from like faxes still being a thing and like law firms and stuff, those technologies are still going to be used for a while. And it is nice to physically own something. There's something about physically owning. This is my copy of Jurassic Park on DVD. And I think that's going to be hard to make people give up. What do you think? Uh, I think, so I think you're correct that while there, while there will be a need for physical media, such as in schools where like accessing streaming is, you know, maybe more difficult than, than other things, DVDs will probably always be the standard because they're, uh, they're very convenient. They're, uh, any, basically any computer with an optical drive can burn a DVD. Um, DVD drives are extremely cheap. DVDs themselves are very cheap. The image quality is good enough for most purposes. Um, like, cause you, you could also do like Blu-rays, right? But like, you got to have a Blu-ray burner. Those are more expensive if you, so I don't think they're dead in the sense that like literally no one uses them. Um, I do think they're dead in the sense, like you said about faxes. Like I think faxing, fax machines are a dead technology, even though they're still in use. That doesn't mean they're not dead. Nobody's making updates to like the faxing standard, right? Like nobody's coming out with new, new features for their fax machines. Like fax machine is basically figured out and dead and i think dvds are the same way like you're not buying a new dvd player with like cool new dvd features it's like it's the same dvd player that you would have bought 20 years ago um so i think so in that sense if you're um, mad about that opinion you can definitely send us a fax about it we'll definitely receive it <laughs> yeah yeah um and i i so yeah i think it's sort of a lowest common denominator still in that like get, game consoles can play dvds i don't really know anybody with an actual dvd player anymore if they needed to play a DVD, they would play it on their PlayStation or their Xbox or whatever, or they maybe they have a, a DVD drive on their computer. Um, but that's the other thing. It's like optical media in general is kind of dead because streaming is just is better at this point. Like you, c I can download things from Steam faster than I can rip them off of a Blu-ray. You know, yeah. if I had a if I got a game on a Blu-ray that needed to install from the Blu-ray, it's actually slower than just downloading it from Steam. And I'm fortunate that I have a pretty good internet connection at home, which is not the case for everybody. But um, in that world, I don't I don't need it. I don't need a disc. And especially in PC gaming, when the disc is like just a Steam code anyway. Like even if you had the game on the disc, like you still have to register it to your Steam account and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, no, you don't own anything anymore. 
<laughs> True. Which I'm okay with. I'm kind of okay with it. It doesn't really bother me. My mom is so funny because she'll try to give me stuff that I just don't want. And one of the things was a combo VHS and DVD player. And I said, nah. Like recently? Yeah. I was like, no, I do not need this. Jackie, what are you doing? No wow. one needs this. You should go put this in a Goodwill. <laughs> yeah. With a VHS too. Yeah, the VHS oh, is what like blew my mind. I'm like, why? We want to go just watch and rewind some tapes? No, I'll just go watch it on Netflix or I'll rent it on YouTube for three dollars before I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I just don't, I I agree with you, Joel. That I think your government teacher was talking a little hyperbolic, you know in that sense of saying it's dead because it really isn't dead dead it's dead to consumers like you and me but there are still places in the world that are going to use dvds also i don't know anything internationally what it's like maybe they're a thing internationally True. still this is just i just know the united states and even then yeah, i'm like I, kind of iffy on it because i'm sure there's places in the, the united states where people still use dvds a lot I, I don't know i could tell you alaska was behind in technology for a while you know yeah. And and uh, like I guess they're not dead in the sense like like tapes are dead. There are zero uh uh t- times and places where a tape is a better choice than a DVD. So in that sense like tapes are dead, right? But DVDs aren't because sometimes in very strange circumstances a DVD is actually the right thing to do. And that's usually like streaming is unavailable and burning a DVD was super easy. You know. Like a new movie do new movies come out with DVDs? Yeah, they still do. Then that Most case, of the time, it's like a Blu-ray pack where you buy the Blu-ray and it comes with like a Blu-ray and a 4K Blu-ray and a DVD and a download code and it's like 10 bucks. And like, those are pretty cool. So in that case, I would say that DVDs are not fully dead yet. If if you still can get them from new movies. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a good question though, Joel. It may really spark a mm-hmm. conversation. I got this next one. This next email is from... Martin. And Martin says, Hey guys, I'm still a little behind on your podcast, but I'm catching up quickly. And I have a few burning questions I need to ask you. You ready for some burning questions, Tyler? Yeah. One, did Tyler ever find that Ocarina of Time gold cartridge he was looking for? Nope, never did. Would really love to have an Ocarina of Time gold cartridge, but I do not, sadly. Oh, that's sad. Two, whatever happened to, quote, infinite bits do you remember this tyler we were going to change the name yeah. of the podcast and the answer we were. to that question is someone stole it there was Dang, man. it was we mentioned it on the podcast at the time and there was no podcast called infinite bits and then like two months later one popped up with that name and so we never changed it for that reason so not mad at them in any way shape or form we were just weren't on the ball so hey yeah that's okay at this point codex it is it's fine Three, when is the pre-order date for the Jaybird Tournament Edition on the Myler console so I can give you all my money? <laughs> February 30th. No year yet, <laughs> but it's going to come <laughs> out on the February 30th. And then number four, this one is super random, but were you guys recently at a concert in Bend, Oregon? <laughs> there nope. were two guys standing behind me for a while that sounded exactly like you do. I know you probably weren't there, but how cool would that be, lol? <laughs> Uh, nope, I've been to I was Bend, not Oregon. there. I have been to Bend, yeah. I've been to Bend, been Oregon, there. but I, yeah, I, I was not in Bend, Oregon at that time. So anyway, keep up the great work and have an awesome day. Thank you, Martin. I love those questions. Those are, yeah, the infinite bits thing, that that's that kind of bummed me out for a while because we just wanted to shorten the name of the podcast. But at this point, we're Codex, and I think we're fine with it, right? We're going to live with it. Mm-hmm. Do you want to read Patty D's question? Yes, I do. Hi, Mike and Tyler. Your show continues to be great. I'm currently on my second playthrough. Wow. I listen to every new episode and then go back to earlier episodes. I was wondering what your thoughts on cloud gaming were. I only have a Switch since I just don't have time to sit in front of a TV to game. Handhelds are the way to way for me. It was recently announced that Resident Evil Village, Biohazard, and the 2 and 3 remakes that are coming to Switch as cloud... Um, and there's also Kingdom Hearts series available now as cloud. I think I could be okay with that if the price was lower than it seems to be. I have a hard time trying to justify paying full price or more for games that I can only access at home, which is a bummer since I would like to play all those games. 
Also, side tangent, if you do any more movie episodes, I think uh, it should be a movie you have both seen. The Mario Bros. episode was better than Doom. It felt more mystery science theater with the awesome commentary. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to read this, and I can't wait for more great episodes. Thanks, Patty D. Um, Yeah, we could, I mean, yes, I I think Doom was fun because we hadn't seen it, and I think also Mario Bros. is fun because we had seen it. So we can do we can do both. But that's good feedback that the Mario one was better than the Doom one, possibly because we had already both seen it. Yeah, we were kind of entranced by Doom watching it. I know. We were like watching it for the first time, so a lot of it was just us sitting there like just taking in the movie, whereas I've seen Super Mario Bros. a lot, so uh, I'm happy to just talk the whole time. That movie still slaps. I'm going to say it again. Yeah. It still slaps. It, it's not a good movie, but I still love it. I, um, as for cloud gaming, what do you think, Mike? This is on the announcement that Stadia is ending, correct? Yeah, that Stadia is ending. Announced. And they're refunding everybody, which I kind of, I like that. I'm glad they're doing that. Yeah, and I, I I also am glad they're doing that. But I think it's just not there yet. That's the big thing for me. I, it's going to get there. And it kind of goes back to what you just said about DVDs with internet connections. Like yours is very fast, but a lot of people's are are not, mine included. My internet is not very fast. So I just don't, yeah, I, I personally, I, I want it to be there. I don't mind it. I do like owning things though. That's It's kind of a hard thing for me, Tyler, because I'm torn between this idea of we should move forward in technology and everything should just be streamed and we should like free up landfills of old video game box waste but the other part of me is like i really like owning something so (laughs) yeah yeah it's 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 hard what do you think i think uh so the problem right now with cloud gaming is that when everything is perfect and when conditions are right which is not all the time or even most of the time i would argue um it is fine it is just as good as uh playing on your pc or your console or whatever that's when conditions are perfect it is just as good as it is never better it is just as good when conditions are not right which is most of the time it is way worse it is just a really bad experience when that happens um which is kind of a a problem for it i think as time goes on and and uh conditions become better and better and better maybe that changes um, I think Stadia's problem was it lacked a game that, like, it lacked a killer app, right? It lacked, like, that game that you needed to use Stadia for. It was just all the same games that you could play on other things. Um, and most people use a service like Stadia or, or Xbox Cloud, I think, as sort of a, a backup or secondary system. And so when it's not as good as the, your your primary system, then... That makes it tough. Once it becomes good enough to be the, your primary or only way of playing games, it's going to be different. But I'm glad that companies keep trying it. But I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's it's tough. And there's always the like when they try to charge full price for a cloud game, and then but you know that they're going to shut those servers off eventually. Like those Kingdom Hearts games that are on the Switch as cloud games, they're not going to be there forever. But you do still have to pay full price for them. Which side note, those games are 20 years old, so we shouldn't be paying full price for them anyway. But that's just my thoughts. I agree with your thoughts in that sense. If an older game, it should go down in price. Very against the whole Nintendo keeping things sixty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I want to harp back to what you said about Stadia not having a big game because, again, going back to the main thesis statements of our podcast, it's all about those games. Yeah, and if you don't got it, then you're you're not going to get there. I think Microsoft Cloud Gaming has that benefit then of having Halo. I wonder if that's going to be the one that like goes forward. Yeah, I like Xbox Cloud Gaming better because it's sort of a, a like an extra feature of Game Pass that you already have. Like, I'll pay for Game Pass. I think it's worth it without the cloud stuff. The cloud stuff being there is cool, and when it works, and I I use it. Uh, I don't use it very often, but like when I have used it to play a game, um, and it worked well, I'm like, that's cool. But it's not something that I want to pay extra for because it's so inconsistent in how well it works, you know. Yeah, it's good for me. Cloud gaming, I've used it to try a game without installing it. And that way it works. Yeah, that's really nice because then you don't have to wait to download it. But it very much is only good for certain kind of games. Like if you're trying to play Overwatch 2 on cloud, you need to have the timings right for that kind of game and it's not going to work. Now, if you wanted to try Slay the Spire, cloud game it up, you know, it's a card game. It's yeah, that's the best kind of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are definitely games where, where like, if you're playing a game like Civilization, you could totally do that on cloud gaming. Um, and because, like, 
if you have even a full second of lag, it's actually not a really a problem. But in other games, that's a big problem. Even half a second or a tenth of a second is a pretty big problem. This is a side tangent, but that's what we're known for. Are you going to play Overwatch 2? And I have a confession to make. I have never played Overwatch 1. Oh, I played Overwatch 1 when it first came out. I had a decent time with it. Uh, then I got tired of it and moved on. Um, I I should check out Overwatch 2. I mean, it's free, so, you know, you might as well. Um, I'll probably check it out just because it's like a big update and stuff like that. And I, I think at being a paying customer of the original Overwatch, I think I get all the new champs or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, I'll check it out. I like that they go into a free-to-play model. That makes more sense. Yeah, I think that always made more sense for, for Overwatch. Nice. Well, I hope we answered your question about cloud gaming, Patty D. Thank you for the email. Next email, Obscure Childhood Games. This is from Will from Ohio. Hey, Mike and Tyler. Will from Ohio here. Last week's episode was really neat to hear about the story of We're Back, It got me thinking about obscure games that I played as a kid and sent me down a two-hour YouTube rabbit hole of old game playthroughs. Most of them were either from the Sega Genesis or PC. I remember playing games like Barney Hide and Seek, Taz the Tasmanian Devil, and Jurassic Park game on the Genesis and Duke Nukem 2D, Treasure Mountain, Nightmare Ned, Star Wars Dark Forces 2, Oh That Cantina Music Always Takes Me Back to the First Level, and some offshoot Sesame Street game on the PC. We also had a disc with a bunch of mini games called After Dark Games. The animation and sound quality were rough on that one, but it kept me entertained. These were some of the only games I had growing up, so I look back on them more fondly. However, few of my friends have ever heard of some of these games. I'd be interested to hear more of Mike's favorite obscure childhood games as well as Tyler's. Not quite as obscure, but definitely some categories I would be interested in hearing about more would be the history of computer games like Humongous Entertainment. They did Backyard Football, Baseball, Putt-Putt. Freddy the Fish, and Spy Fox, and Jumpstart for Education. That would be a really good one to do. I remember playing these games for hours during the summertime in grade school, and I feel like they had a big impact on kids who didn't have consoles growing up. Keep up the great work. You guys rock. And of course, Spider Butts will. Hmm. Oh, man. Jumpstart games? I never played those. I think those were a little after my time. I played those Jumpstart games. Uh, Humongous Entertainment... I think I played backyard baseball when I was a kid. Yeah. Both that in sounds, real life I, and that video game. I feel like I would have played that game if I had access to it. As far um, as more obscure games from my childhood, I have one that I think I've mentioned on the podcast before that's just out there, and that is the Cool Spot game, the seven up branded game for the Sega Genesis, where you play as the <laughs> Cool Spot. I was a big fan of that game, and I played it recently again and it did not hold up very well it's very hard that's a bummer um I, i'm trying to think of like old like obscure games um that i played i did play treasure mountain he uh will mentions treasure mountain that was a fun game there was a there's like a that was like a whole series of games there's like treasure mountain and uh treasure galaxy i think and like a treasure cove and like there's a bunch of those those are like educational games um and i used to play of course math blaster i loved math blaster um episode one in search of spot and then i think there was an episode two but then i don't think they did any more after that that was fun um one game that sticks out to me that i got that came with our very first windows pc that we bought in 1997 was uh, a game called uh cover up at roswell it was johnny quest Do you remember johnny quest i love johnny quest yeah so Johnny Quest had a game, it was two discs, it was two CDs long because it was kind of like Myst, I think, and it was like a sort of hot, fun, like click around, like adventure game, like PC uh, adventure game, or maybe something like, uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm blanking on another one, but it, it was cool and it had like a lot of video stuff. It had clips from the TV show that was new at the time, like the real adventures of Johnny Quest or something. It wasn't, it was based on that show, not the like 60s show. Oh, yeah. Um, and I had a lot of fun with that. And my mom used to play it with me because I had a lot of puzzles and she always really liked puzzle games. And so us like solving puzzles together were, were fun. I don't know if we ever finished it, uh, but we did put a lot of time into that game. Um, and I've never heard anybody talk about it ever, except for just me. Cover up at Roswell. Two disc Johnny Quest game. All right. You um, just reminded me of my other obscure educational game I played. You ready for it? Yeah. Bill Nye the Science Guy. Stop the Rock. 
Whoa, I've never heard of that. The one. whole premise of this game is that there is a meteor a meteoroid, excuse me, because it's coming to Earth, threatening to destroy the Earth and hit the Earth, right? And the government makes a AI named Max that is like supposed to stop the meteor. But what ends up happening is Max doesn't stop the meteor unless you answer seven science riddles. It's very much a kid. And <laughs> And you have to walk around Bill Nye's lab a la mist style movement and solve these science riddles for Max in order to stop the asteroid or not the asteroid, the meteoroid from hitting the from hitting the earth. Guess Dang. what? I never got it. I never won. Oh, you always got hit by the meteor? Yeah. Meteoroid? It was fun though. I don't think it was a timer though. I think I just gave up. Like we get frustrated and give up. But the other game that I played that was educational for PC as a kid that was kind of obscure, but probably not super obscure, was Amazon Trail. So they had Oregon Trail, oh, but they yeah. also had Amazon Trail, and I really liked that a lot. You could go spear fishing, it was super fun. Really, cool Yeah, it's like game. basically the same game, but themed as the Amazon instead of Oregon Trail. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know how much it holds up in like modern contemporary history, but I, I really enjoyed that game, and it would be worth doing an episode on that. The other games I've done that are like obscure I've talked about before, like I thought Snowboard Kids was way more obscure. Turns out a lot of people played Snowboard Kids during their childhood. I do too. It's so good. And then yeah. the Army Men games that I liked, like Sarge's Heroes, I thought those were kind of obscure, but those are also kind of, they got a, a, a not cult classic feel, but definitely some momentum now is like nostalgia. Yeah. I also used to play the the Reader Rabbit games uh, oh, on I Mac, this, like Rabbit. way, way back in the game. Yeah, I played Reader Rabbit. That was fun. Yeah. There's so many good games here to talk about. All right. Thank you for the email, Will. That was very nice. That's a very good email. I love it. Do you want to read the c- c- combo breaker email from Bowser? Yeah. yeah. yeah the subject line is c- c- combo breaker. Hey, guys. It's Bowser again. Question for the both of you. Take your last game you play to relax and mix it with your last action game. How does that game play out? Again, love the cast. Keep up the great job. Lagaya butts. Bowser. So the last game that I played to relax was Stardew Valley, and the last action game I played was last night when I played The Witcher 3. So Stardew Valley mixed with The Witcher 3 <laughs> is my game. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think of what the last like game I played to relax was. So my uh, guess is I would be like a Stardew Valley character farming, and in between farming, the neighbors would ask me to slay monsters that are terrorizing their homes. That's probably what would what the game would be. <laughs> If I had to guess. Yeah. Um, I did spend a little time recently playing SSX3, which I consider a relaxing game for me, especially if you do the like conquer the mountain where you just you just snowboard from the top to the bottom of the mountain and it takes like 20 minutes to half an hour. It's I find it pretty relaxing. So that mixed with Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Um, so if you were snowboarding down the mountain but had to stop and get off your snowboard to fight monsters when they came up, yeah, that's that's what that game would be. You know, I just realized... Stardew Valley wasn't the last relaxing game I played. I played City Skylines. So what if it's like Ooh. a city builder mixed with The Witcher 3? Like you go out and you kill monsters and build a city. Or maybe you're building the city and the monsters pop up while you're building the city and you have to fight them. I don't know how it would work. It would it would be weird, but I love <laughs> this. I love this so much. It would be fun, though. It would be fun. I'd be into it. Thank you, Bowser. Big fan of that email. So we got an interesting email. I'm having kind of a conversation, and I don't know if they want me to read it on the podcast, but they mentioned, so I'm not going to say their name, but they mentioned why we haven't done a Minecraft episode yet. Mm -hmm. And it's a good question. And I feel like we could talk about that for a little bit because we're both a little torn on it because me, I'm torn because I feel like it's definitely still not history yet but it is over 10 years old it is over 10 years old and on the other side of that coin i played the alpha in 2000 what would that have been eight i owned the alpha like i've been playing minecraft since all you could do was mine and kill skeletons and creepers and zombies so (laughs) i do have the backing on it of like playing this game for so long so i think the answer to the minecraft episode idea is maybe we should look into it again i think there's a lot of history even before minecraft like what are the things that came before it that led 
to Minecraft that's happening. Minecraft itself is a very influential game, and then you can sort of put like go forward with that too and be like, what games were influenced by Minecraft? Personally, I haven't spent a lot of time playing Minecraft, um, and I feel like there that it's popular enough at this point that I I want to be able to do it justice if we did a episode on it. Um, and I don't think I could do that. I just I'm it's not a I think that game came out just like a little bit at a different time for me that I it was not I was not into it. Yeah. You know what? You just mentioned a really good point about games before that influenced Minecraft. We had a recommendation to do Dwarf Fortress. Oh yeah. And that is Minecraft's direct inspiration. So maybe instead of doing Minecraft first, we go play figure out Dwarf Fortress, do an episode on that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good idea. All right. Good. We, I just wanted to address that real quick. I thought that was a, a really good question. And I, it's important for us to mention why, because we thought about it. We definitely thought about it. It's just we haven't committed because there's a lot of things that are like, is this history yet? We don't know. So, yeah. Do you want to read Matt in Japan's email? Yeah, we got an email from Matt in Japan. Uh, the, the subject line is Splatoon with an exclamation mark, like Space War. Space War! Um, hey, Mike and Tyler. With Mike talking about how he likes those short, low-commitment multiplayer sessions like Omega Force and Pokemon Unite, may I suggest you check out a little game called Splatoon, namely Splatoon 3, which recently came out, and it's all I've been playing on my Switch. I'm not normally into competitive shooters, but this series got me hooked ever since giving the original a shot way back on the Wii U. R.I.P. It puts a twist on the genre by making the objective of the core multiplayer mode be to simply paint as much of the surface area of the map with your team's color. While you can kill other players, it doesn't really affect the outcome of the match. And so different play styles are encouraged. Sweaty players that like to charge in and kill each other, chill players that like to sit back and paint the base, sneaky players that like to go and paint the enemy's base, and so on. The best part about this, matches are only three minutes long. Wow, that is short. I like that a lot. There's all kinds of weapons that widely vary from your typical assault rifles, SMGs, and snipers, to paintbrushes, to literal buckets of paint that you dump on people, to my personal favorite, the paint roller, which lets you casually paint the surface and run over anyone who happens to be in your path. On top of that, there is a cooperative PvE horde mode and a a fantastic single-player story mode that feels like a cross between Super Mario Galaxy and Ratchet & Clank. That sounds great. I did not know that that's what the single-player mode was like. Um, Hope you check it out soon, and because it's a Nintendo first-party game, the price will never go down. Uh, Kumo no Oshiri, that's Spire Butts in Japanese. Matt in Japan. Thanks, Matt. Well, if that wasn't a sell for the game Splatoon, I don't know I what know. is. I didn't know what it, I, I'm about to go buy it. I, yeah, I, I would see the commercials for this game all the time. I just didn't know what it was, so, and I never really looked into it. And now I feel like that sounds super fun. Yeah, I played the original a bit. Uh, I think I played it with Matt on his Wii U probably back in the day when it, when it first came out, and I remember having some fun with it. Um, but I know the new one is out and yeah, it's not worth it to just wait for a sale. Like normally in, I would be like, eh, I'm not sure I'll wait for a sale, but it's Splatoon 2 is probably still $60 if you find it at the store. So um, I'm, I should probably just buy it. And a cross between Super Mario Galaxy and Ratchet and Clank for the story mode that, wow, I did not know that that's what the story mode was like. That sounds awesome. The only way you're going to get that on sale, I think, is on Amazon and you'll get the hard copy for like $10 off maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's really good to know, though. I'll look into Splatoon. Thank you, Matt, in Japan. Gosh, love me some Matt in Japan. It's the best. Me too. All right, final email of the day. Which game developer would you like to meet in person? This is from Mo. Hey, dudes, it's Mo. Thought I'd do my part to help your stuff, your mailbag this week. And then he's got a sweet gift from Star Trip Troopers about doing your part, which I love. <laughs> Star Trip Troopers. Okay. Lately... I've been enjoying the new YouTube videos from Masahiro Sakurai, the creator of Kirby and Smash Brothers. He's been releasing short videos which cover different facets of game development. It's been really fun to watch and I've learned a lot already. Kirby Superstar is a childhood favorite of mine, so I've always thought it would be cool to meet Sakurai in person just to thank him for all his work on those early Kirby games. If you could get lunch with one game developer or someone in the video game industry, who would it be? Butt spiders, Mo. <laughs> that butt spiders are so much scarier than spiders. Yeah, spider that's so scary. <laughs> I, I felt weird when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the obvious for me is, but it's weird because he's already a personal friend of the podcast, is, is Shikira Miyamoto. Uh huh. But I, because I mean, Zelda, Mario, all the, the things that got me into video games was Super Mario World. So it'd be weird to not. Mm-hmm go with that but also his lunch schedule is probably full you're probably right hmm do you have one 
I'm trying to think of like who would be like the most fun to probably to hang out with. Like if I sat down with Shigeru Miyamoto, I could say, yeah, I love Mario. I love Zelda. There is a language barrier there. Assuming even the language barrier is not a problem. I, I don't know if we actually have that much to talk about, right? No. Other than me just being a fanboy. Lunch with Kojima would be weird. Right? Yeah, that that would be good. That would be cool because um, it's weird. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, pull pull a different one here. Um, I think if I could get lunch with any game developer, I think I'm gonna go with Cliff Blazinski, the creator of Unreal Gears of War. He worked at Epic for a long time, uh, and he left I think after Gears of War three. Um, I think it would be Cliff Blazinski because he had a lot of success in the late '90s, early 2000s in games, and then he uh, and then even into Gears of War. Like he had multiple successful franchises, not just like a one-off. Um, but then when he went to go do his own stuff, Boss Key Productions, um, they made Lawbreakers and they made that Radical Heights game that never actually came out. He didn't see the same success, and I would like to talk about, like, ask him about the juxtaposition of like. What's the difference between those things and the things that you worked on in the past that were very successful? And I think he's kind of a, a like a a guy who's not too upset about ha- having failed. I say with air quotes because I mean he released games, but um, and he's working on stuff now. I don't know. I think he'd be cool. I think he'd be fun to talk to. He seems like like a a, a person who is uh, outgoing enough that like he would keep up a conversation too. Um, yeah, I think I'll go with Cliff Blazinski. That's a good one. What about? I mean, it's. You know, I don't know if he's really a developer as much anymore. But Todd Howard. Oh yeah, from Bethesda. Yeah, because that's got so much history of games I've played also since I'm a child from my childhood, and I could ask him all my burning questions about mm-hmm. Skyrim and Fallout and Elder Scrolls, and like, I'd be like, "Hey, where, where, what happened to the dwarves?" And he'd tell me, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. And I'd be like, why are there so many bugs in the games? And he'd tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I wouldn't ask him that. He knows He knows there's a lot of bugs in his games, I feel like. Do you think that's also kind of the charm of Bethesda games? Because I'm starting to think of it as like a charming thing. It's part of it. I mean, uh, it's, it's it's charming when it's a funny thing that happens and you just laugh at the, the goofy thing. It's not charming when it causes you to like lose a save file or something like that, you know? So it just kind of depends on the context. Yeah. You know who else uh, would be interesting to talk to that's contemporary, like very contemporary, is the, I got to look up his name. Hold on. Eric Barone, who developed Stardew Valley. Oh, yeah, because he's like a, a solo, one-person show. completely solo developer. That would be an interesting lunch and grew up in Auburn, Washington, where I grew up. So. Well, hey, we could be, be like, able to talk like, about hey, that. Did you ever go to the Super Bowl? And he'd be like, yeah. And then we'd just sit there in silence for 40 <laughs> minutes. But yeah, I think it'd be interesting because also the whole idea of like not only doing an indie game, but also doing a game that's completely solo. You're you're teaching yourself so many things while you're doing it. That's just an interesting idea to me. Mm-hmm. And to pull yeah, it off. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And to pull it off very successfully. Yeah, very much so. So with that, I think that's the last email of the day, right? We did it. We did our email. We did it. There's still more emails in our inbox. So apologies for that. But that's where we're going to cut it off here today. And we'll read those other emails later or we might not. And it's okay. That's just the way it is now. We're getting enough emails now where we kind of have to pick and choose. I hope that's okay Mm -hmm. with the team. Is everyone okay with that? They're all probably nodding, hopefully. Toby's okay with it. Toby the cat's okay with it. Delilah's cool with it. She just keeps claiming she wants more chicken. I don't know. <laughs> with that, if you want to send us an email, you can do codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. You could also join our Discord either through email. You can, I can send you an invite or you can go to my Twitter at mecoletta, M-E-C-O-L-E-T-T-A, and click on the pin tweet at the top of my profile. That is an invite that never expires. Tyler's on Twitter too, at sneakerelf, E-L-P-H. You want to say bye to everybody, Tyler? Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.